Muchas gracias, Mercy, que es como la conozco, porque es María de las Mercedes, ¿no? Eh, y con los años, pues uno también cambia, ¿no? Eh, eh, algunos se vuelven más intelectuales y otros más sociales. Pues sí, más social. ah, okay. Bien, eh, verdaderamente es casi un atrevimiento aceptar hablar de la educación en Cuba ante una asamblea de cubanos que son educadores. <risa> Así que espero que eh, acepten mis humildes eh, comentarios. Ah, habíamos acordado eh, con el plan original que yo iba a dar la charla en inglés, que no es mi primera lengua, pero que por supuesto podríamos después tener un conversatorio o, o un periodo de preguntas y respuestas y lo haríamos ya en castellano si así querían. Eh, bueno, I'm honored to be invited to speak here tonight. It is challenging to discuss the topic of education in Cuba, the more so because I, I, I stand, I know, before the best informed and most critically discerning audience on this issue that may be gathered. And when we discuss uh, some of the scholars of Cuban education, we can really understand why. Um, before I proceed to, to examine education in Cuba today, and what and how it projects into the future. Let me highlight the state of the Cuban educational system on the evening, on the eve, I'm sorry, on the eve, this is in shorthand, okay, um, on the eve of the revolution of 1959. Um, something that I believe is often ignored by the so-called analysts of education in Cuba. So they assume that they can start at zero. Um, actually, and because I need to be brief in giving this background, um, we really can begin speaking of a, an educational system or educational policy in Cuba, uh, beginning with the American occupation. And that, of course, brings to the forefront the figure of Enrique José Barona, who first served under the occupation government and then uh, headed the office the, as the Ministry of Public Instruction. Um, I should mention that at the end of the War of Independence in 1898, 64% of Cuba was illiterate, according to that, the census done that in 99, and of course was devastated by the war. However, in 1902, 172,000 students enrolled in courses, which represented almost 11% of the island's population, but was only about half of the estimated school age population at the time. By 1910, and that, and that first decade was absolutely um, spectacular in the way that there were the number of classrooms, the projects for normal schools, and to develop the island went. However, by the 1910s, school enrollments began to decrease. Retention was very poor. 75% of 184,600 students in the primary schools in 1919 were enrolled in the first and second grade. The goal, in other words, really began, you know, so that children would go maybe for two years to school, learn the basics, be literate, and that would be the end of schooling for them. And this became an issue and part of what we really can consider, or I consider, a national trend. In fact, we can argue that trends affected the Cuban educational system since the 1910s. Among in the trends, we can see increasing budget allocations, but spending them ineffectively and with political partiality, a growing gap between the urban and rural populations, access to education, and the government's inability to deliver to and place its educated population. I need to fast forward for the, for in the benefit of time. So let me forward now to the 1940s. Okay. The primary school curriculum went through various revisions since that first decade, and especially when the problems began in the 1920s, a number of Cuban specialists really did a number of publications and things, really trying to address this problem. Um, and I, I, we can argue that it went to a number of revisions basically through 1944. At that time, a very specialized program was approved for Cuban schools. And to the original core courses were added Cuban history, this is 1944, and, and an integral enrichment program in arts, music, foreign language, health, and physical education. 
praiseworthy on paper, the new, the new curriculum require a corps of specialized teachers in a country where rural areas where the breaking ground for the first school was still only a dream. Uh, in, beginning in the 19, 1940, at the Plan Remos, a five-year program proposed by the literary scholar Juan um, Jose Remos, became the standard that replaced the original Plan Barona that had been established in 1900. Uh, the Plan Remos basically added a fifth year to the secondary school program, and then the, which meant that the older core curriculum did not have to be significantly, significantly sacrificed to accommodate humanities and other courses that were added at the time, because the fifth year kind of uh, covered these. Added to the requirements then were Cuban history, literature, geography, as well as the study of the new Cuban constitution of 1940. To summarize, someone who did it better than I would, writing in the Diario de la Marina in 1954, the historian Ramiro Guerra lamented that the public schools where he had taught at the turn of the 20th century and that had so well educated all of his children were no longer there for the next generation. All of his grandchildren were attending private schools. In fact, we, most of us can uh, relate to that personal experience because it is supported by the expanding landscape of private schools in Cuban cities and towns during the 1940s and 1950s. Thus, the Cuban public school system maintained its initial momentum, 1900, 1902, through that first decade, but then declined, never to recover after the world economic recession began affecting the island in the 1920s. If the culprit had simply been financial, then by the 1940s, the system should have been thriving along with the developing economy. That was not the case. Taking into account a growing population, between 1943 and 1958, the school age population grew by 253,000 students. The government's allocation of 23% of the national budget in 1959 55, I'm sorry, 55, made it the highest school budget in Latin America. This should have provided the relief needed for the system, but it did not. The percentage of school age children who registered in public schools rose to 52% by the mid 40s and had not improved from that figure by 1958. Policies follow, follow the same politically expedient and non-transparent pat, pattern of the past. I'm going to give one example cited by the UNESCO report in 1956 of a 20 million loan for school construction. Only 20% went to rural schools the previous year, 1955. Some analysts have argued that private school enrollments could have reached 120 to 200,000 students by 1958. And I'm thinking of Jose Alvarez Diaz, Mercedes Garcia Tuduri, who devoted a lot of attention to this topic, and a few others. And in fact, that would represent somewhere between 500 and 800 percent growth since 1934. Those estimates would hardly explain that at least another 200 thousand students did not enroll in or had no access to schools in a country where communication significantly improved during those same years. Remarkably significant, I find that in 1944, 27 private schools had 2,214 students enroll in the official Plan Remus College Preparatory Program. And in 1958, so that's 14 years later, a total of 168 schools reported an enrollment of 14,800 students. Clearly, private institutions were nurturing Cuban students at the expense of the less efficient, less academically demanding, and increasingly politically violent uh, public secondary schools, which nevertheless graduated 35,700 students in 1958. And Mercedes Garcia Duri points out that even that figure of 35,000 some did not count graduates from technical, vocational, and normal schools. Thus, the growing university-bound student population is indicative of a school feeder pattern created by the new universities on the Cuban scene. 
particularly the prestigious Augustinian run uh, Villanova University. Additionally, three more public and eight private universities were operational in Cuba by the late 1950s. We can conclude that Cuba's educational system developed within the Enlightenment secular tradition, balanced by significant academic competition provided by the increasing number of private schools that efficiently delivered the government's own established curricula. What and where public, public education was lacking, blatantly so in the rural areas and among a few sectors, a growing nationalist, predominantly urban and educated citizenship deemed that failure, that failure to reach those others to be political and a matter for honest constitutional governments to solve. In the colonial tradition of viva el rey y abajo el mal gobierno, they blame the political grass, a class, greed lots democracy of the 1940s and the dictatorship from 52 to 58 for the inaccessibility to the social and economic fulfillment, fulfillment corresponding to their educational sophistication or for the lack of it to the 23.6% of the population that in 1958 was still illiterate. Um, which, by the way, still make Cuba the fourth lowest rate in Latin America. And if one breaks down that 23.6 illiterate percent, um, in terms of provinces, we find that there's a real pattern. You know, Havana province is in the 80 percentiles with the city of Havana in the 90 percentile. By the time you get to Oriente, of course, you are dealing with, you know, under 30 percent and even dramatically different between Santiago and the rest of Oriente province. So clearly, there was a gap here that no one had paid, um, paid adequate attention to, in spite, of course, being the fourth lowest in Latin America. Thus, the goal of free and universal access to education is stagnated after the first decade of the 20th century, when political instability, lack of transparency, and the growing pains of development between the primary city, primary city of Havana and the rest of the country, etc., began keeping progress behind the young nation's rising expectations. When the Cuban state only offered rhetoric in support of Jose Marti's project of an educated Cuban citizen, parents simply headed to private, often religious schools and asked for scholarships or chose to further strain their family budgets to cover tuition and related school expenses. That is why as the 1950s came to a close and student activism was on the rise against the dictator in power, many in Cuba believed that their schools had finally produced a generation capable of implementing demo democracy, in this case, through the Constitution of 1940, and eliminating malfians, so promised the revolution of 1959's leaders. That commitment included the constitutional guarantee to deliver education for all and to do so with academic freedom, a goal clearly not compatible with the Marxist-Leninist ideology soon professed by the revolution's leaders. What happens in Cuba after 1959? Of course, education, along with health care, becomes a leading tenet of legitimacy for the regime. Political mobilization, particularly the literacy campaign, um, right at the beginning, certainly contributed to the reaching the goal of universal access in less than a decade. Notwithstanding this major accomplishment, there have always been weaknesses in the system, always, um, often, difficult to analyze because researchers depend on data published by the Cuban government or data from the United Nations, UNESCO. Um, the latter, of course, uses the official data that Cuba provides. In the interest of trying to look at these 50 years of the revolution, and of course, I can, you know, we can later discuss that there's been ups and downs. Um, you know, Cuba, of course, starts doing much better towards especially the 1980s with Soviet aid, having a lot of troops fighting, I mean, up to 300,000 in Africa. So it meant that these people were not you know, looking for jobs in the marketplace. I mean, a series of things, while, of course, after the collapse of the Soviet world, all these shatters. But both apologists and critics attribute certain features to the revolutionary Cuban educational system. And let me say where I think there's a common agreement. Yes, there is free universal access to education through the ninth grade. Two, the system seeks to engender a new socialist man 
based on Marxist-Leninism, El Hombre Nuevo, as proposed in that famous article by Che Guevara. Um, three, there should be a work-study component, very often by having to do voluntary work in the countryside and away from family and um, community. Uh, the education is geared towards the scientific and technological matters, um, ironically, to produce uh, an economic development, and perhaps this is the greatest fault of the system, that after 50 years and all this high education, it has not um, produce, you know, what every developing nation wants, better educated um, classes that can indeed guide the nation. Five, a centralized decision making. All the decisions come right from the top, Ministry of Education, higher education in some cases, okay. Uh, but it's certainly centralized decision making. Um, all so-called community relations, meaning parent, teacher, activities, school events, what have you, are all managed through official mass organizations. So either a Comité de Defensa, or the Pioneros, or you know any, or the Communist Youth, always, you know, or the the women, uh, la federa, you know, la Federación de Mujeres, always guide anything related to the school. So therefore, the guidelines for the meeting, for the actions, for any activity, is always geared through those mass organizations. And finally, the seventh point is that rewards and deprivations are determined by political profile. Every child in Cuba has a file that mentions if the family is politically active, if the father is a political prisoner, if the child says something inadequate uh, from a political perspective, et cetera, and this file moves along with the, with the student. Uh, like I say, I'm generalized, but I think in overall, even people who are so-called apologists for the revolution concur uh, and that indeed there's this pro political profiling. And like I say, there's been ups and downs here, but basically that's what has happened. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think my greatest problem with a lot of the apologists for the Cuban system have to do with their, their disregard for the history of education in Cuba and the resources that the, revolution, uh, the revolutionary leaders used and depended on to really move that educational agenda right away. Um, uh, scholars like Martin Carnoy, uh, Richard, uh, Mark Richmond in England, or Jean-Pierre Beauvais um, have certainly written very impressed with Cuban education. Um, Lavinia Gasperini, an Italian scholar, uh, writing in a project for the World Bank as recently as 2002, and I quote from her, the, looks at Cuban says, the record is outstanding. The Cuban case demonstrates High quality education is not simply a function of national income, but of how income is mobilized, end of the quote. Um, and most recently, and I think what really caused Nagai to, to yeah. organize this lecture, uh, Denise Bloom um, wrote a dissertation at the University of Texas. And I must say that her methodology is very interesting. And I actually, I have used that kind of anthropological um, methodology sometimes to conduct research. She relies on what is referred to as participant observer. You know, she moved uh, into Cuban homes, gathered data, um, and basically she focuses on the so-called escuela al campo, uh, the requirement that students, you know, before they enter the high school, the secondary level, attend or do so many weeks in the, in the countryside. She concludes, and I cite, that cu Cuban socialism inhabits incommensurable positions. Cuba's socialism is both everlasting and steadily declining, a peculiar dynamic, seemingly duplicitous behavior in Cubans' daily lives. That's very hard to follow. Yeah, uh, it's very hard to follow because what you do, you know, you read her and she'll say things that make sense, but then she'll say something that doesn't, and it's almost like anything goes. And, and at the end of it, you know, it's like, wow, this system is surviving and it's still creating socialists that haven't lost their hopes. I really had a hard time with her book. Uh, even though I propose that you invite her. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's better to have a peaceful evening. I don't know, I don't know. It was, it's really a very, um, for, I found this to be a very confusing um, approach because ultimately, I don't think the history is there to back it up. Um, I mean, here she's saying that the Escuela al Campo declares, uh, I mean, really makes people who really feel socialism, but on the other hand, she's quoting especially parents that really view the escuela al campo for what it was. The idea that it would break the child away from the home, 
So you know that that network, you know that that line is really that umbilical, umbilical cord is really broken, and the child is on his own, and certainly um, it, it's it's much more malleable at that point, especially during an age that typically you know promiscuity can really um, be a major problem. For decades, respected scholars such as Carmelo Mesalago, among a few others, have questioned Cuba's statistics, but again, it seems like to no avail. And last year, Enrique Pumar, who teaches sociology at the uni uh, Catholic University in Washington, published a study looking at graduation rates. And that doesn't necessarily match the figure of those, who, of course, who enroll in the schools in Cuba. Um, I, myself, have done research, particularly interviewing independent teachers and a number of people in Cuba. My greatest concern is that when it comes to technical knowledge, the Cuban system seems to do fairly well. But when it comes to skills such as critical thinking, there's a lot of questioning there. And of course, a lot of those tests, as we know, standardized tests do not measure that. Um, my thesis basically is that the disparities in the educational attainment in Cuba results from the ideological character of education. In other words, the student is in school not for instruction's sake, but so that he can be a better Marxist. And that makes everything else secondary in the process. And I think this is why we see this disparity. I think if you live in South Florida, you must have experienced many times uh, the sense that you know you speak with people who went through school in Cuba, and sometimes you're really impressed how well they express themselves, how well they articulate their thoughts, and then you next you meet someone else who apparently went through the same system, and they might even tell you that they are ingenieros or whatever, and they can hardly articulate a thought. And it's almost like, are they coming from the same system? Um, there's some disparities here that we cannot really address yet. I also see some issues that were never solved by the revolutionary government. Clearly, the pre-revolutionary period used private schools as a valve. You know, the frustrated parent ended up just sending the kids to private school. That was no longer there because, of course, private, um, or what they refer to as non-public, because the word private makes them nervous, um, is, is obviously not an option in a communist regime. Uh, and clearly could not be placed within this communist ideology. Um, if all scholarship on Cuba is polarized, yes, the scholarship on Cuban education is extremely polarized, uh, as I just cited a few examples. Um, let's recognize the topic itself is very political. Just look how we argue about education in the United States. As a school principal, I'm sure you face that all the time. And, and so if we, Imagine if this happens in an open society, how difficult it is to carry that in a very totalitarian system. Ultimately, though, I don't want us to forget that the problems affecting developing as well as developed nations and their educational system are, of course, also present in Cuba. I mean, Cuba must confront is now the economic recession and the fact that governments make cuts to the education budgets social isolation that is particularly common today, perhaps more than any other era because of the you know, global economy, economy, the internet, the students certainly have a lot less uh, of cohesive community uh, sense. There's also that tremendous disconnect between career options and market placement. I mean, why study or, or study what the government wants or what to do if there's no position that will allow me some kind of economic well-being after graduation. Clearly, these are problems that all of our societies are facing today and ultimately lead to a lack of motivation to complete secondary school in many cases and even, of course, even considering going on to the university. However, even if these problems are present worldwide, in Cuba, all these challenges are exacerbated by the totalitarian order. Remember, all decisions emanate from the top. So at local level, this cannot really be handled very well. Also, the communist system has done things that now are firing back. The fact that they have totally placed the parent out of the decision making, and they did this purposely for decades, means that the parents, for example, are not a pressure group. 
like they would be in this society where parents complain and vote someone in or out of office. I mean, you just don't have that mechanism because they destroyed it. So now it's backfiring against them because even at the community level, there's not, I mean, they're always talking about parent-teacher engagement, but it's always within that realm of what comes from directives from the top. Well, so what is the future of education in Cuba? I believe that based on what's happening now and the last 20 years since the collapse of the Soviet world and the funding, we are seeing more than ever a decline of the so-called professional class. By now, it's been 20 years, a little more, and what we find um, is that a lot, now we really have a generation that should be pursuing higher education, and the, there's less capacity for that. They're being more selective. Again, more political pro profiling is involved, and less opportunity to study. At the same time, there's a lot, of, the, a lot less motivation to do so on the part of many. The students that are preparing for college in Cuba very often are dealing, of course, with very poor conditions, it's buildings in ruins, maestros emergentes, where, you know, I have a student at the university that actually had teachers who were like 14-year-olds running classes. This is why they keep the statistics that they have 20 students per teacher. But basically, you know, absenteeism from the classroom is very high, both on the sides of student and faculty. Okay, so what I've seen and we've seen in the last, especially in the last eight, 10 years, is a tremendous erosion of what had been gains. Um, you know, education may be free, but if you don't have the transportation, if you no longer have the child care, that pretty much kind of said, you, you know, the child has to go because you're not staying home, that sort of thing is, is flying by. Um, so that, I think that's decreasing the, the universality of that and also, if, the, if Cuba had made gains um, in decreasing you know, rural um, illiteracy and, and bringing schools to the countryside, what is happening is that since the dollar um, was legalized, um, obviously the tourist-related jobs or money-making opportunities take place more in the urban centers, certainly not in the countryside. So that even further um, weakens you know, what is already um, that, uh, that area. So basically we can argue that there's been an in intensification of these weaknesses in the last decade in Cuba. Can there be a turnaround? Um, I think most of the solutions, and in that book you mentioned, you know, I go into a lot of details about the many things that need to be done. Any re national reconstruction project has to have, um, for example, a component for education, training, all these sorts of things. It's the sorts of things that I think Educators everywhere are exploring, and certainly governments are. However, the most important one in the Cuban case is the, the need to open the system, the need for private initiative. From an economic perspective, you need private initiative because then this, the government doesn't have to spend as much money schooling. But from the perspective of those that look at the civic culture, it's not a question of having the government save money by running an only public system. It's the fact that parents have options, that you can send your children to the school of your choice and that you can follow through through that. And I think private initiative and, this, and, in, and decentralization is basic to that. Uh, ultimately, I believe that Cuba needs a return to a civic culture that values education. And there's very little on that across the island right now. And perhaps it's time to open to questions or comments or criticisms. This is, so with those words, I'll leave you. <laughs> okay. Okay, you wanna call? Um, hey.